Yeah, I'm not young anymore, but <laughs> I wish we had a young YCP group when I was your age. But um, well, thanks for inviting me. It's really, really great to be here. I learned a little bit about your organization, and it really is a wonderful opportunity to have that uh, time in life when you've got peers and others that are having similar celebrations and struggles, and even as you grow even further to keep the, that network alive is really, really exciting to see. So I'm really impressed. Okay, um, I, prepare, I spent about three days preparing a slideshow, but I didn't bring it. <laughs> it's in the car, but I walked, I drove up and I thought, you know, they, I don't want to bore them with a bunch of pictures. Let's, I'm just going to talk. So I, mean, I think it was the Holy Spirit that was kind of saying, don't show them your slides. <laughs> so. I'll try to share some, th some visuals with you as I walk through uh, my journey in life and all the way up through uh, the present day. Basically, I've, uh, when I was in high school, I, I realized I wanted to be an architect. But it was based on some things that happened even, even younger when I was younger in life. Like, um, and it's pretty typical. You play with blocks in kindergarten, and then that turns into Legos, and then that turned into uh, building little houses and... Lincoln Logs, okay, familiar with a lot of people. Well, Lincoln Logs, maybe not. But, um, <laughs> but that led to uh, building model buildings for my train sets with my brothers. And then when I went to um, college, we built models for our projects. So that model building was fun, and, and I got into architecture. And now we get paid for building models, which is pretty cool. Um, actually, I pay other people to build models, but I get to kind of play with them a little bit. <laughs> Uh, I went to, uh, I grew up in St. Margaret Mary's Parish and then St. Joan of Arc Parish after that. Uh, from St. Joan of Arc, I went to Creighton Prep. And at Creighton Prep, that's probably where I really strengthened my own faith and, and Catholic beliefs because I went to a lot of retreats. And <clears throat> I actually was thought about the priesthood when I was at Prep. And I spent a week and a half living with the Jesuits. And then I decided not to. <laughs> so, <laughs> but no, it was, it was a great experience. I learned a lot. It, they really helped me go through a, sort of a, a mini discernment. Because I think they get a lot with, with some other high school kids. And they really, they didn't push. They didn't pull. They just said, see what you can discover. And, I, and in, in that process, I kind of strengthened my, I, heard, I really felt that there wasn't the true calling to, to the priesthood. But there was a calling to, to devote something in my life to Catholicism, my faith, or to God. I wasn't sure what that was. Well, then when I got into architecture, went to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and uh, I was part of the Newman Center in Lincoln and uh, played guitar at Mass. And then when I got out of college, I got a, a job with a small firm. And then about nine months later, I had a, a job with BVH Architects. And my first project was a grocery store. And I did grocery stores for about 12 or 15 years. But alongside that, within the second year of my career at BVH, I helped work on the St. Columkeel Church in Papillion. So I just got a piece. I was a young man. I was a drafter. And then from there, the next big project that I helped secure, I went to the interview and actually got the job, and that was St. Wenceslas. And that really changed the course of my career because... St. Wenceslas was a very involved project. It was a master plan, then we planned the church, rectory, social hall, school. We did all those pieces, and we eventually ended up designing about seven different phases. But St. Wenceslas is where I met Brother William with uh, the worship office, and he was a huge influence in my design attitude, and it has to do with and it applies to everything, but it has to do, especially with churches, wherein if we're going to design a building that serves the people of God, we're designing our client is God. And so having that thought about, how, my gosh, talk about high, high expectations. <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to design something that God's going to be happy with. But it really became, uh, over the years, it was St. Wenceslas, and I've, I worked probably the biggest... Plum was we were selected to do the renovation of the St. Cecilia's Cathedral back in 1997 and have it completed by the Jubilee year of 2000. 
And through that and many other churches, I've worked in Omaha and St. Bernard's. Um, I've worked in churches, in, Catholic churches in California, Michigan, Missouri, North Carolina, all over. But with each one, it's that thought of we're going to help this community of parishioners bring the best that they can to honor Christ. And so doing that with architecture and design stretches from the plan of the land, how you're going to use the land, how you're going to be, stu- be good stewards of how that land is used. And today it's, it's really built into the way we think in terms of sustainability, you know, using God's resources in the proper way. But then designing every piece of furniture and appointment within, within the church and in some cases beyond just the, the church space. So I learned a lot about Catholic liturgy in, in, in a way that from teachers that I could never ever dream of from school. But Brother William, uh, probably over two dozen different priests who had various levels of knowledge of liturgy, some a lot, some none at all. We've hired liturgical consultants from around the country to help design churches. And then we've been hired Eventually, over time, we've been hired as the liturgical architects for other churches, like one in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, one in uh, Shawnee Mission, Kansas. So <clears throat> having that breadth and spectrum of involvement in not only Catholic churches, but we've done an awful lot of Protestant churches too, um, it just gives you a really high level of um, expectations for yourself to keep getting better and to serve these people because people ask what I like about designing churches and it's it's really that moment when a church is dedicated and you turn it over to the parish or the users the people that it will affect their way of worshiping both personally and as a community for the rest of their lives and their children and that moment of having the dedication and seeing the families and the kids start to use this space that you had a big hand in, not just in the architecture, but in the furnishings and the materials and even the process of design. And I'll talk about that for a second. I mean, that satisfaction comes from not just that moment, but everything that led up to it. So, one thing that we've developed over the years is a process of engaging people in the communities that we're serving to design that building. So we start with, with workshops that we really insist that everyone is invited. We're, it's very inclusive, very par- participatory, and the more people in the parish or the community that get involved, the more ownership they have of the building when it's completed, both sort of physically and financially. So there's a lot of reasons you want to get them hooked early. So, but when they get involved in the process where we're asking you for your input and design, and we say we're really not designing for you, we're designing with you. We're really facilitating the process of bringing your church that meets your personality, your parish, to fruition. So if you look at our portfolio, and you can go online, bbh.com, we've got a religious section You'll see churches that are extremely traditional and some that are extremely modern and everything in between. And the reason for that is that we don't believe in in a style. We believe in designing for the personality and the character of that parish. So, for instance, uh, obviously with the cathedral, it's a historic building. The firm is, our history of the firm has really been a foundational in historic preservation. Uh, We did some work. We've done a lot of small renovations of Catholic churches in rural Nebraska and all over rural Iowa. But the, the, um, some designs are adding on to historic buildings, and we don't want them to look historic. We want them to look of their age so that the historic building maintains its own character and it's strengthened by whatever addition we do. So there's always a different way of approaching projects. When we did in Hiawatha, Iowa, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, the average age of the parish was 29, and they wanted something that was very modern. This was 2007, I believe we did that. And then we go to another parish, and their average age is 
29 and they wanted something very traditional. So it wasn't, there were no stereotypes. It, it really varied so much between parishes and it just made it such an enjoyable type of project to work on. I mean, the satisfaction of when you're finished to have that process lead these people to really own and, and embrace their, their building is, is just a wonderful feeling. The, um, the latest accomplishment, of course, is St. John Paul II Newman Center. Um, this is one of those projects like the cathedral that you didn't want to end. You just wanted it to keep going and going because it was so much fun. The, um, the client was so different. It wasn't a parish. It was the archdiocese. Father Taphorn led the team. There was a committee of uh, volunteers, donors, and people that were really interested in making it happen. But the design was, was for the students, it's for the users, it's for the, the people that are gonna, going to uh, be using this on a, not a lifelong basis like many parishes are, but one that, that's going to see a lot of turnover with a lot of different people. And so that kind of brought a different attitude of how do we design this so that it's not for the people that are here today, but it's also for people that aren't even out of grade school yet. So we started the plan of JP2 Newman Center by going to monastic models because monasteries had a dining hall, they had a uh, residence element, libraries, chapels, and they're all based around a cloister. It's a medieval ma monastery model. So we looked at plans of that <clears throat> and the plan of, that we have here with the courtyard like the cloister, the oratory is the chapel, dining area, living space, uh, and residence hall. It's almost an exact duplicate of a medieval plan. So it's truly based on tradition. It's based on the core uh, liturgical uh, aspects of, of historic buildings. There's a lot of other things that I could spend hours on talking about. Axes and things that line up and the oratory faces east, isn't that cool? This eastern sun comes up in the morning. That wasn't by accident. That was all planned out. <clears throat> At the same time, we had a very tiny piece of ground here. It was kind of a challenge to kind of squeeze it in, but still provide an exterior space that's very private. We put the, um, the tall building on the north to sort of shield the campus from sort of the secular world. We have a creek over here, so that's kind of a natural element that we can open ourselves up to. On. A lot of the design was based on the life of John Paul II. <clears throat> John Paul was from Poland. He, <clears throat> he worked in a quarry. I don't know if anybody knew that, but he worked in a limestone quarry. And we have historic photographs of John Paul in the quarry working. And so the limestone became a very important element to the plan. We wanted to go over and pick out Polish limestone to bring it back but Taphorn kind of put the nicks on that because it was too expensive. <laughs> so, but father was, father was great. We, uh, we recognized we'll probably have to get limestone from Kansas, which was okay, <laughs> from the Midwest. Uh, but the other major element um, was we, we studied John Paul's life, and he was, a, he was a teacher, and he worked with the young people. And uh, that was part of the reason they made him the, the patron of, of the Newman Center. But we have photographs of him with students laying in a park, reading books, teaching, talking uh, with the kids, and they're surrounded by oak trees, by white oak trees. So, and white oak is like the predominant species of tree in, in Poland. So when you go in the oratory, that's white oak. The, the exterior material and the material that you see right there going into the narthex is all limestone. And so, that's really evocative of John Paul II. And there's other elements, of course, the stained glass windows are based on the encyclicals of John Paul II. The, uh, all the artwork in the space and the furniture, everything was designed by not just the architects, but by the team. I mean, Brother William, Father Taphorn, uh, others had a very big hand in, in all that design. But being involved with that, and again, bringing the best we could bring to that space for people to, to have it. How is it going to affect how people worship? <clears throat> uh, both, again, from um, an individual 
basis when you're in there by yourself <clears throat> or with a community at Mass or other services, that's what we want to make the best experience for everyone that uses that. And that applies, again, to every church we've, we've worked on. So <clears throat> that sort of fabric or that stream of working on churches to serve a community and to serve God while we did that had a really profound effect on myself. I got to know a lot of priests through that process and other uh, people of religious life. I've been a member of the Sarah Club for years, and it's something that uh, having gotten to know priests and others and what they, I don't want to say what they go through, but, but what privileges they have in their life. And to, that's one thing that I've really done a lot of volunteering for is trying to help people realize if that's your call, what a wonderful privilege that is, and promote that through the Sarah Club. So that's one thing that we were doing. When we were in, uh, I was in Spain, my son was going to school in Spain, and uh, he's in Mallorca. And we walked by this, we're just walking down the street, and here's this church, and there's this statue, and it's Unipero Serra. And that was kind of struck me because I, it was just by accident because he grew up there in, in Petra in Mallorca. So, <clears throat> so I have a, a strong tie to the Serra Club. But uh, overall, as, as I've kind of had that opportunity to not only design Catholic projects. I've also done a lot of higher education work with uh, the University of Nebraska, Metro Community College. I still take that working f for God into those projects. It, it's kind of, it goes, it emanates beyond just religious work. And that makes it really, really fun. It makes, it's been a fun, fun career. So we're not done yet. We're working right now on a brand new Catholic church in uh, Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Fort Dodge, Iowa. And we're doing several other renovations in all over uh, Omaha and the Midwest. And it's just great to continue to do that. We've got some young people in the firm now, young Catholics. I'm going to take an application back to the office, I think, for some of them. But um, they um, are getting involved with the liturgy again. And, and so now I'm mentoring them on how we apply and the knowledge of liturgy to the, to the spaces we've been designing. So it's, it's a lot of fun to get to that level in my career. So, And that's about it. So I'll open it up to questions if you guys are ready to shoot anything at me. And Claire, my niece, Claire Urias from Lincoln, she came up here just to see me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a familiar face. So good to see you. Any questions? Yeah. So I liked what you said about collaborative design. So I'm, I'm guessing sometime in your career you've had a situation where the pastor wants one thing and prominent parishioner so-and-so wants another and you kind of get caught in the middle. So do you have any tips on how to work through something like that or like what's your approach to, to issues like that? That's a great, great point. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of very challenging situations. There was, and it's always the Protestants that are giving us trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we walked into a... In Fremont, there was a church, I think it was Lutherans, and they, uh, we walked in and we were hired to design their, their church, and they had an existing building, and we thought they were going to be adding on to it. We walked in, and there was, the room was split like this. It was much smaller. There were about 10 people over here and 10 people over here. And the chairman of the committee says, okay, we, here we have the GO committee. We want to build a brand new building somewhere else, and this is the STAY committee that wants to build, build on our current sites. So we had two opposing factions to begin the project. How great was that? <laughs> but no, it's um, collaboration both within the architectural team as well as with the client is just, uh, it's a real fun process. And we start things off early by setting the stage for how we're going to interact and bring our ideas. So t we try to avoid that by doing some sort of, uh, oh, um, you know, pre- conditioning in order to help people understand how they're going to interact and, and dialogue and communicate. So like when we do these workshops and we bring everybody in, we never uh, stop any idea. Everybody can bring their ideas. They write them down. We have techniques to where everyone in the room can bring their ideas and they're not forgotten or shoved aside. We always incorporate them in future meetings. But the best ideas will surface. And we have a saying in the office that the best idea wins. It's not where it comes from, it's not the person, 
It's just what's best for the project. And so as we sort of uh, have that uh, pre-collaboration discussion or kind of set down ground rules, it really does help avoid that. We, we've had some people that may have been really strong personalities. Um, and that's just something over, over the years I've just learned to, to deal with them in different ways. And we'll talk to them off, offline. We'll, we'll bring them in to have a special meeting with them to get their ideas and then let them feel special because they think they can do everything because it's their checkbook. But then you have that talk and they kind of understand it's really, they need to think for the greater good. So it's, it's worked out fairly well. We haven't won every battle, but we try to make everybody feel important, feel heard. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you've worked on a lot of different churches and different styles and different states. So do you feel like that variety has allowed you to experience God in different ways or rediscover different aspects of your Catholic faith? Yes. Um, it feels sometimes that um, it wasn't up to me when we were selected for a project. And it just feels like well, was the Lord the Holy Spirit was, was saying, you need to be involved with this. We did a church in Lincoln, California. Lincoln, California is about 20 miles north of Sacramento, north of Roseland. And we had a brand new Catholic church. The parish was made up of uh, Hispanics, Filipinos, and a lot of wealthy white people from Indiana, Ohio, and they all moved out there. And so we sensed that this was going to be a tough one. We had language barriers. We hadn't seen, had ever dealt with that before. So we arranged to get interpreters, and we set up workshops for uh, both the, for the different people with different languages, mainly the Filipinos and Hispanics. But then we made them work together with everybody. We mixed it up. We made sure there was a lot of diverse interaction. And we were told later by the pastor that no one had paid attention to those groups before, like we did. And so it felt, and so it, it strengthened the parish. It brought people together. And it felt like that was almost uh, part of the reason we were there. You know, it was really a moving piece because it was, we weren't there just to build a building, but we were build, helped there to build the community. And so you just to get a sense that, that you're, God's telling you to do more than just, you know, your drawing and your architecture thing. And it's really about building community. And so it's brought my faith in that way to where, and it started a while back, but I don't enter a project thinking, oh, we're going to design a cool building. It's we're there to serve. It's really a servant leadership. And so that I've taken that servant leadership concept and really applied it to my own business. Well, I was president for 10 years of the firm, and we weren't bosses telling people what to do. We were servants helping our staff be the best they could be. And so it applied directly to business in the way we learned how to design with, with different parishes. So, is that... One more question. Um, I've heard from some crowds that there is a revival in like traditional church architecture. In your experience, would you say that it's a kind of a toss up for how many modern versus traditional you do? Or is there happy medium? Or are you seeing that there actually is a revival in a more traditional church architecture? It, that's a fascinating uh, development. Um, we did, you know, St. Bernard's. Anybody familiar with St. Bernard's church? Okay. In the 70s, they, they stripped all the historic stuff out of it, and they whitewashed the roof, the ceiling, and they took out all the pews, and they put chairs in, and they took the altar and put it in the middle. That was the thing to do back in the 70s. That was a huge movement, and the, um, uh, we were involved with that. I mean, we got into that with some churches where we simplify the interiors. The pendulum swung. We, went, we didn't do the original... Uh, that 70s renovation at St. Bernard's. But we were brought in to come and sort of recreate the historic, kind of take it back to its historic roots. And it was tough to do because everything was stripped out and, and we had to come, come up with ways to make it feel more historic. 
So we did a lot of research, and if you go see it, you walk in, and, and we hope it feels like it did when it was built in 1939. The movement um, is very real. There's some, um, uh, there are people at the University of Notre Dame. Um, the, um, there's a very big movement of going to traditional architecture. It's interesting because the youngest priests nationwide, the young ones are the ones that are pushing that. And it's, you know, we're, we're not trying to make any judgments or say which one or the other. We've got certain philosophical beliefs that we don't necessarily believe in building a brand new church to look like it was built 500 years ago. We recognize that there is a desire for that character and for that traditional feel, the traditional uh, essence of those buildings. The building we're doing in um, Fort Dodge, Holy Trinity, is very traditional. And yet we're trying to make it feel like, okay, this is a traditional building, but it was built in 2018, not 1518. And uh, there are um, architects who I know from Notre Dame and from, uh, oh, Dustin Stroik is one of them and um, Dennis McNamara. They designed churches for the Lincoln Diocese, very traditional, like the Newman Center in Lincoln. They were part of that. So it's not one's bad or one's good. It's just they're different. And it's different attitudes. And again, it comes down to the, the users and the, and the people that are going to really um, worship there and what the purpose of the building is for. So it's, we've done them both ways. And there's kind of a debate within the studio of what's the right way to do that. And again, we're trying to... We try not to be style, stylistic, but we listen to our clients and we serve them and we do, we don't do what they tell us to, we do what we believe they're asking for. So, yeah. Give it up for Paul. Thanks.